Hey yo everyone and welcome back to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're going to be diving into episodes 337 through 339, which will cover manga chapters 442 through 444. And I apologize, I'm still kind of recovering from a cold, so my voice might sound a little off on this podcast. But now that we are diving back into the canon story, let's begin with the new arc with the spooky thriller bark arc. That's a mouthful. Anyways, let's start with a synopsis. The Straw Hats basking in their new ship, the Thousand Sunny. They come across a mysterious barrel that sort of lays down a trap for them to get caught in. And along the way to their next destination, they get lost in the fabled Florian Triangle where they meet a gentlemanly, creepy skeleton. Alrighty, so the differences, not too many huge ones here. Obviously, pretty much everything prior to them finding the barrel is all filler, basically the first nine minutes of the first episode, until we see Zoro seeing the barrel from the crow's nest, because we kind of have to lead back in from the filler arc. Um, as I mentioned previously, normally in the manga, what would, what would happen is is that when they were doing all the shenanigans with catching the shark and sort of getting to know the, the Sunny for the first time, instead of coming across the Phoenix Pirates, they come across this barrel instead and they, we lead straight into Thriller Bark. Another di- difference is, interestingly, we do get to see the moment where Nami reacts to her waiver being modded to the to include the, sort of the white horse figurehead that Frankie snaps on it. And apparently she doesn't take too kindly to it in the anime. Where in the manga, we don't necessarily see her objecting nor really getting super excited about it either because it's only sort of mentioned in passing when Frankie goes over the soldier dock system as a whole. Also, because of the filler portion, the part where they all catch all the little octopi and make the the dinner that Sanji makes is all based on octopi recipes, which in the manga, we don't actually get to see. And then also... The final difference is is the way they depict that random guy dying in Brooke's little flashback about the sunlight is kind of really different in the in the anime. So in the in the anime they show it, it really depicted very differently from what it ends up being and also how it's portrayed in the manga. So in the manga you just see a panel of a guy set ablaze and burning up as the sunlight hits him, which is what's supposed to happen based on what actually happens in the in in the rest of the arc when we see other characters getting burned up like this. And so I don't know why they decided to change it for the anime because they clearly knew what was coming. So it's a very strange change. Alrighty, so with that out of the way, let's get into my thoughts. And obviously, because we are coming back from the filler arc, it needs to work itself back on track. And so the first half of the episode, like I mentioned, uh, of episode 337 is still filler as they sort of enjoy life on the sunny. It does give us a better look at the interiors of the sunny a little more. And one interesting note is that we get to see Frankie actually make the modifications to Nami's waiver to give it the white horse head, like I mentioned. And it eventually gets uh, another thing he's working on, which is a reveal for later. And we also get some new wardrobe changes for a few characters. And most surprisingly, Luffy has done away with his iconic red shirt and has replaced it with an orange one. And while I do think he looks best in red, the orange is actually a good look for him too. Now, I don't know if this is a spoiler or not. I, I, I mean, I don't think it really is. But this isn't a permanent change. Luffy will eventually go back to his red shirt. But not for a while, now that I'm thinking about it, though. And after some shenanigans, we finally get back to the main story when Zoro notices a strange barrel floating in the sea with a sign that says treasure on it. But it turns out to be a barrel that someone dropped off for good fortune that contains nothing but booze and rations, or so we think. They decide to open it, but before that, Luffy finally gives this Really simple and childish prayer while we get to see Zoro's uh, atheistic views uh, again as he says he's not praying to any god. But the thing I really love is how he mentions how foolish it is that Luffy is praying to a god when just a little while ago he beat the crap out of a supposed god in Eno. (laughs) Uh, I always thought that was really funny. It's just one of those funny moments that I really love when we get to see the crew just kind of messing around with each other and act 
you know, like fully realized people as they all interact and react exactly how you'd expect them to based on what we know about them. It's why everyone, pretty much including myself, love these like chill crew interactions between arcs so much. Like Oda has done such an awesome job creating and developing these characters that at this point, we don't even care what they're doing. It's just entertaining seeing them goof around and doing literally nothing. However, upon opening the barrel, it launches a flare high into the sky, which Robin intuitively deduces that this may signal a predatory ship waiting to attack an unsuspecting uh, ship who comes across this and walks into this trap. Then, seemingly unrelated but coincidental, a storm starts brewing where we get to see our second but canonically the first part of the Sunny's soldier dock system, the rowing paddles in the zero dock, which is an awesome upgrade as they now don't have to get the row out and, and paddle. And, and although it does take away the comedic moments of some of those moments, which was hilarious uh, a few times when they had to pull those things out and row themselves manually, I especially loved when they had to do that all the way back when they had to get away from Laboon the first time. <laughs> that was always pretty funny. But yeah, I mean, it makes sense that they, a ship that large, that they're not going to be able to manually paddle it anymore because the thing is like, the Sunny is like three times bigger than the Mary was. Maybe even four times. Anyways, now we get to the good stuff as they find themselves in a dense, foggy, and creepy part of the ocean. And we get a call back to some setup that Kokoro mentioned back in Water 7 as Frankie confirms that they're now in the mis- mysterious Florian Triangle, which Usopp begins to freak out because he actually wasn't in the room when Kokoro explained all this, if you remember all the way back. And so he this is news to him. And spine-tinglingly, immediately we realize that this wasn't some folktale or BS story as we see a ghost staring at Chopper that no one seems to even notice. And cutely, Chopper immediately goes to Zoro for protection like always. And first off, I have to say I love Thriller Bark for this new tone and setting. I, You know, it has a good amount of issues for sure. This arc is not perfect. And I'll, I'll get into more of those as the story progresses. But for me, Thriller Bark offers some really funny and new story dynamics as it dives into a slightly, I don't want to say like horror, but it it, it is much more uh, the horror, scarier side of things. And also, I personally love the subject of the paranormal, even though I'm not a strict believer of ghosts or anything, but I love watching ghost videos and stories on YouTube and and reading them uh, online. So this is a perfect mashup for me. And of course, one of the more well-known concepts is that humor and horror are not too dissimilar in emotions, and Oda mashes these concepts up really well. And Thriller Bark is absolutely one of those arcs that kind of dives further back into the more comedic side of One Piece, whereas we've seen some fairly intense and serious arcs as of late. So this shift back to the silly comedic side is another reason why I really love Thriller Bark, because it's a nice breath of fresh air, I feel like, to sort of break up the intensity that we've been kind of feeling ever since uh Arabasta, Skypea, Water 7, Ennius Lobby, like all of those, sure they have all their comedic moments, but for the most part the tone has just been incredibly intense and it just keep kept ratcheting up one after the other. And so having this sort of like cool down period after the most intense, which was Ennius Lobby, is a nice change of pace. But getting back to the story, we start off with Sanji acting like he's going to calm Usopp down. But his face and tone of voice indicates anything but that as he does everything he can to have fun with scaring Usopp with the stories of ghost ships. (laughs) Sanji's face and behavior here is so divergent from what we've seen so far. And I freaking love this moment. And that's when it happens, though. They hear this creepy humming in the distance and an actual ghost ship appears alongside them, freaking everyone out except Robin, who's startled but doesn't have quite the 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 usual comedic, like, wide agape mouth with white eyes. She's not quite there yet, although you will see her start to warm up even more uh, throughout this arc, and I'll point some of those changes in her behavior out as they show up. But that's when you see it, though. A talking skeleton is staring back at them while singing and drinking tea. 
And this is actually kind of creepy yet also funny at the same time because, yeah, Oda actually, again, he balances that really well with this scene. And of course, instead of scaring him, Luffy is excited to go investigate. And if you recall back on Water 7, one of Luffy's predictions slash hopes were to see a living skeleton and now he's gotten his wish and he's all for it. Luffy wants to immediately go, but Sanji being sort of the level-headed one makes sure that Luffy has a chaperone and then that Zoro introduces a drawing of straws to see who will accompany Luffy on the ghost ship. And this whole scene is hilarious as there's a trio of Sanji, Robin, and Frankie who are all chomping at the bit to go explore while the cowardly trio desperately want to avoid going. Nami and Sanji end up drawing the short straws and as they climb onto the ship, they come face to face with a literal skeleton man staring back down at them. And this guy is tall, like almost twice as tall as Luffy. But it turns out he's pretty friendly and excited to see them and also rather chatty as well. And I love the first thing that Luffy notices about him after the fact that he's talk- he's a talking living skeleton is that he's got an afro because Luffy's got, you know, he's calling back to his weird obsession with afros from the debut back fight, along with things like laser beams and rhino beetles. Luffy's got some really interesting uh, obsessions. Anyways, this talking skeleton is not all what I or any of us expected, as he's incredibly polite, quirky, and constantly making skeleton puns. And there's some... Even some more funny wordplay here with the skeleton when he uses the phrase, my eyes follow the beautiful ladies. In Japanese, he actually says, watakushi bijin ni mega nain desu. Literally translating to, when it comes to beautiful ladies, I don't have eyes for them. But really, it expresses a meaning of the fact that he loses the ability of judgment when it comes to the beautiful ladies. So when he says that phrase, he doesn't have eyes for them he then follows up with, actually, I don't have eyes since I'm a skeleton, is a double-layered joke in Japanese, which is, I mean, Brooks jokes are, they work mostly well in both English and in um, uh, Japanese. But this one, I feel like some of them do get a little lost, like this one. Or there's multiple layers to it, which uh, this one has. Then, as a bit of subversion from his polite and proper dress and speech, he follows that up with an incredibly vulgar request to Nami asking to see her panties, which is so random and something I'm not too much of a fan of. I mean, we already get enough of this kind of stuff from Sanji, but it does lead to another funny, almost fourth wall breaking joke after Nami kicks him in the head. He develops a bump on his head and Sanji wonders, why the bump? <laughs> like, yeah, why is he developing a bump when he's got no skin or tissue? And if that wasn't funny enough, the first thing Luffy just casually asks the, this talking skeleton is if it poops. And the question and how it's asked on its own is funny enough, but how Sanji reacts is gold as he yells, there are a boatload of other questions that should be asked before that. And then Brook gets up, takes his time to compose himself, and as a matter of fact, he answers, Yes, I do poop. And Sanji again, swooping in with the, don't take so long to answer a question like that, and who cares? And Hirata Hiroaki and Cho, who the man who plays Brooke the Skeleton, are just amazing here. And it's been a while since I've laughed this hard in One Piece. And this isn't even the funniest joke of the entire arc. I mean, we're just getting started. Sanji then barrages him with actual relevant questions. But before that, he gets interrupted by Luffy, and Luffy invites him to join the crew just like that. And the crazy thing is, he accepts. We don't know, we don't even know his name yet, and we have the ninth straw hat all of a sudden, right at the beginning of the arc. And that was a huge twist and shock at the time. And this moment in the manga obviously gets the proper treatment and gets a two page full spread in the manga, which is really cool. We then finally get a proper introduction to the skeleton as he calls himself Brook. And already Brook's dynamic with the crew is hilarious. I love Zoro's reaction as he's fed up with how crazy everyone is. Especially the part where this weird creature is now a crew member and scolds Nami and Sanji as they were tasked specifically so something like this doesn't happen. 
And I yeah, I love how they treat Luffy like with kid gloves and he's this man that just took down Luchi and declared war on the world government. I mean, how do you not love Brooke's energy and how excited he is as well as how freaking hilarious he is with his skull jokes as well as his almost manic-like behavior, which kind of makes sense since he states earlier that he hasn't had contact with anyone for decades and so that kind of isolation probably does a number on, on a person's psyche. But he's a walking joke machine. Another joke that that bursts out laughing for me is how he mentions he's a gentleman that he likes the leisure time spent waiting for his meal and then proceeds to impatiently clank his flatware yelling, dinner, yay, dinner, come on, baby. <laughs> it's so funny. I swear to God, this whole sequence is so fucking funny as Brooke politely asks what all of their names are, starting with Luffy. Then Luffy responds with his own question, asking what Brooke actually is, and then Zoro interjecting with his own Tsukomi joke, demanding to know, just how little do you two know of each other? And not only that, we get another one of Brooke's contradictory lines, how he emotionally mentions how his heart is full instead of his stomach, but then turns to Robin and notices her plate is fuller than her his and asks to trade. <laughs> so she just yells at him, saying, there's plenty of seconds. Eat your own first. Once they're done eating, we finally get an explanation as to what Brooke is. And it turns out it's the work of a devil fruit called the Yomi Yomi no Mi or the Revive Revive Fruit. Yomi being a truncated version of, of the Japanese word Yomi Gairu or to revive or resurrect is where that comes from. Even though we are getting into more serious stuff, the jokes still don't stop. As Brooke starts to talk about his life and death, we see that he's just covered in like food crumbs from like waist up into his afro. And Sanji just kind of casually interrupts him and says, wipe yourself off first. And I think one of the funniest juxtapositions that Oda uses here with Brooke's character is how he's presented as this polite gentleman in this like tuxedo with the way he dresses and he speaks, but his manners are not only rude, but they're downright disgusting. And like how messy of an eater he is or how he constantly asks inappropriate questions. He, he He's also incredibly imposing on his host. Then later he constantly burps and farts at the table during the conversation or he's seen picking his teeth during his story. <laughs> the best thing is watching Sanji, an actual gentleman, in the background, just completely disgusted and annoyed the whole time. Like, I swear, it's hilarious just focusing in on Sanji during this entire dinner sequence. It's so funny. Because, I mean, to him, like, this dining experience is like a sacred moment for him, and <laughs> this guy is just completely wrecking it. But yeah, it turns out he gained the ability to revive once after dying and that he was once a pirate as well. It's interesting that for most of his life, the fruit serves no other purpose than making it so he can't swim. But one fateful day, he perished in battle. But his soul was able to re return from the underworld or heaven and go back to his body, which is interesting to note as in One Piece, there actually seems to be some sort of an afterlife, which is not at all surprising to learn but it is kind of significant nonetheless however in a cruel twist of fate he returned to the foggy waters of the florian triangle and got lost unable to find his body for a year which i mean they kind of casually brush it off but a year is a long time and by that time he, his body had decomposed and all that was left was a skeleton and his afro which zoro points out is weird and Brooke's only response is that he had strong roots. <laughs> However, as the conversation progresses, they notice something incredibly off about Brooke as he explains about the yomi yomi fruit. He doesn't have a reflection or a shadow. And turns out this is due to something completely unrelated. And he explains how his shadow was stolen. And I instantly already knew that whoever took his shadow has the kage kage no mi or the Shadow Shadow Fruit. I, this is just one of my predictions at the time. Uh, during the story, though, there's a couple more funny moments with his scene. And I have to point out, because this is pretty much my kind of comedy. First is when everyone is on edge after discovering his lack of shadow. Brooke just calmly sits back down and drinks tea. And Sanji, the goat, he just barks at him and says, 
Is this really where you calmly drink tea? And then again, when Brooke begins to explain the story, he just stops after the setup and states, to be continued. <laughs> oh, first off, why? Then Sanji again barks back, tell us now. <laughs> I mean, this like exchange is so damn funny. I love this type of like absurdist humor. As I've mentioned, it's so damn well done here. Also, as a setup for the arc, it's also explained that if anyone without a shadow gets exposed to sunlight, they'll instantly burn up and die, which is why Brooke has declined Luffy's invitation, unfortunately, and he needs to get his shadow back from someone that Brooke won't name for fear he might get his new friends caught in the same trouble. And this is all presented in a very comical and bright way, but when you really stop to think about it, Brooke's whole situation is incredibly dis- depressing and dark as hell. Like, this guy died at sea, losing his entire crew. Then his soul gets lost for an entire year by himself, looking for his original body, only to discover his body is decomposed and now has to live as a skeleton by himself, doomed to be trapped in this foggy sea for decades on end. And as I'm assuming, he's unable to sail that massive, massive ship by himself, so he's literally trapped, just floating, like, aimlessly. And it's kind of a miracle he's as sane as he is because that sort of isolation and loneliness would drive most people mad, I feel like. I mean, I know I would definitely be in a lot of trouble if I was in that situation. You know, and what's kind of beautiful about Brooke so far is that despite all this, he's still incredibly friendly and kind despite being a little weird and creepy, um, which is kind of forgivable based on what he's gone through. Then when you dig a little bit further, you realize why Brooke is so excited and happy to see people, as the Straw Hats must be like the first people he's interacted with in a long time. And they've shown him so much hospitality, offering him a meal and talking to him. To top it off, it must have been really amazing for Luffy to treat him like that. And just like any other person, despite him being a scary skeleton, But on top of that, also invite him to his crew. And again, Luffy, with his amazing social and emotional intelligence here, is on display just befriending anyone and everyone. And that's, again, truly something that makes Luffy special. I mean, it's truly heartbreaking, but also inspiring just how thankful he is to have met such kind people. And then after having so much taken away from him, it kind of puts my own life and you know one's own life in perspective and how much we can take for granted but also reminds us to be thankful for the positive little things that do come into our lives and I think that's one thing that I always took away from this scene when it comes to Brooke's introduction and it's such an impactful moment when Brooke really takes the time to say just how truly grateful he is to have met the Straw Hats and it really hits you and and also this the Straw Hats how hard It's been when he says how lonely and scared he's been for so long. Again, it's really sad, but I'll say it again, how inspiring Brooke is with his positivity and tenacity to survive and see the good in life. And I've always loved this scene. It's such good writing and amazing moment that puts your perspective on life into perspective. And Luffy is determined to help Brooke despite his protest. And once Luffy learns that Brooke is a musician... It's all but confirmed. Luffy is determined to help Brooke and get him to become a nakama. And Luffy is finally going to get his musician nakama. And that's something he's wanted the entire journey, which is crazy. Because honestly, once this fact was revealed, I was so hyped for Brooke to eventually join. Because obviously, this is kind of a running joke that anytime from the very beginning, Luffy prioritize getting a musician for some reason over the myriad of other more important positions on the crew that was necessary to st- to sail the grand line and to commemorate this moment brooke offers to play something but before brooke can play anything he's frozen in terror as he witnesses a ghost spying on them all and the irony irony and humor of the, of a talking skeleton being scared of another supernatural being is definitely not lost on Oda. <laughs> and Brooke immediately realizes what's happening, that they've been trapped, and correctly guesses that the Straw Hats found a strange barrel that marked them as a target. Obviously, we can infer that this was originally how Brooke lost his shadow as well, as we are introduced 
to the next island, the Ghost Island Thriller Bark. And this is an interesting change from our normal formula as this island appears to be a roving island that can move around, kind of like the Death Star in Star Wars, a planet that can move around and attack. It'll be really interesting to see the direction this arc goes based on that. Upon seeing this, Brook obviously charges in to presumably go get his shadow back, and we learn that as a result of his skeletal nature, he's light enough to run across the water, which is really awesome. Brook warns them to escape immediately, and of course the cowardly trio agrees, but Luffy's clearly game and even dons his sort of bug catcher gear from Jaya, which he... <laughs> which this time he plans to use to catch a ghost, which I thought was random as a weird callback to that. In addition, I love the touch of Nami and Chopper both using Usopp's normal excuse of having the I can't go to the island disease. And it's here Frankie finally properly introduces the soldier dock system. And we learn that dock 2 contains the wonderful surprise in that Frankie lovingly paid tribute to the fallen going Mary by introducing the Mini Mary number two. So what he said about the Sunny carrying on the will of Mary was in spirit and literal. This was awesome to see. Now, no matter where they go, Mary will still be with them, which is awesome. However, the excitement turns to crisis when something happens to the Cowardly Trio while they're driving around in the Mini Mary and they go missing. And I absolutely love it when we get Robin's trademark morbid dark humor when she hypothesizes maybe they were killed by a ghost curse. And I like that she's more freely able to do this now that she's, you know, freed of the shackles uh, of her past a little bit. And speaking of ghosts, something that really, something really creepy and strange starts to happen as something they can't see is aboard the ship as well and starts messing with them. Oda yet again kind of teases us with the idea of a possibly telekinetic power user like he's done with Buggy, Robin, and Doflamingo, but it's clearly not telekinesis again. Whatever it is, it's some sort of invisible beast, and this is clearly a play on the classic monster movie, The Invisible Man. And we then learn that the Cowardly Trio are now trapped on the, on the island itself after falling into sort of a, a reverse moat trench. And I just love these moments of these three dealing with dangers because of how helpless and scaredy cat they seem. And it's hilarious seeing them freak out each other and the three of them trying to pawn off leadership to the other because they're all scared. It's not too long before the danger does seek them out as a Cerberus finds them and starts to chase them. But if you look closely, this is some sort of like Franken Cerberus. It's it's uh, it's as it's a Cerberus made by stitching together three different dogs together. It's it's even got sort of that traditional Frankenstein's monster stitching all over it. But of course, Oda has to throw in his trademark random ass sense of humor into it and turns out that one of the stitch pieces is not a dog and it's a freaking fox. And the reveal for this form is fucking genius like chopper as they're running away chopper first notices the barking is off because every third bark you hear this growling and barking then a random coo inserted in there when chopper realizes what's happening and points out that the fox head is attached along with two other dog heads and the fox head just sh is shocked and sulks a bit as it seems to sort of have an inferiority complex about this and Oda even somehow manages to infuse this monster with, like, actual character as well, which is pretty impressive. And I remember reading this for the first time, and I was just dying laughing. Because <laughs> it's just so sad, but also so random. And then when I saw it in the anime for the first time with the sound, it was even funnier because you actually got to hear the rough, 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 and cool. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's so... It's pure comedic gold. I, I I love Thriller Bark. And it and there's some even funnier moments to come in the next set of episodes as well. But anyways, they do escape to a tree where a talking bat greets them and offers to take them to safety to a mansion of the famous Dr. Hogback, which Chopper seems to recognize, which means that this Dr. Hogback must be some sort of a well-known person in the medical community. And I mean, I think we can all guess what this means. This is the guy experimenting and making these Franken beasts like this Cerberus. At least that was my thought at the time. But anyways, that closes out these episodes. 
And here we are at the start of a new arc. And what an eventful and hilarious start to this arc. You know, a new fresh tone with an emphasis on thrills and comedy, as well as a potential new crew member, is really a, a strong start for me. And I honestly can't wait to get into the next set of episodes because it contains probably my favorite pure joke or gag in the entire series. This, I always refer back to this joke because of just... <laughs> Anyways, I'll, I'll talk about it in the next podcast. But however... As always, around the holidays, I'll be taking several weeks off for a break until the new year. Um, And so, yeah, no episodes for the next couple weeks. Uh, But yeah, this has been another great year for the podcast. And thank you to everyone that has listened, subscribed, and supported it. You know, I've seen a huge increase in, 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 in listenership and followers. So thank you, everyone. And even if you've only checked out like 30 seconds of one episode, I still thank you all so much if you did enjoy this send me a like or comment and if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching one piece please consider subscribing check out my instagram and twitter account at sunny podcast for updates of when i post new episodes and to see pictures of my manga collection also i'm streaming on twitch so if you want to come chat with me or play games uh, I'd be happy to see you at twitch.tv slash sunny underscore underscore go that's sunny two underscores go And as always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time out to listen to my podcast. Just a tiny spoiler section since this episode is running pretty long. Um, But if you're not interested in that, stay safe out there. And I hope to see you on the next episode next year. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye. So, spoiler section, the only thing I really wanted to kind of touch upon, and I kind of touched upon this in the re- review for One Piece Film Red, is Luffy's sort of attachment to musicians. For the longest time, it just seemed like some some sort of random desire that Luffy wanted a musician as his first crew member. But I'm, you know, after having seen One Piece Film Red and, and sort of the accompanying episodes, whether the, all that is canon or not, it makes you wonder, it, you know, some of it is canon, I feel like. And so if Luffy grew up with Uta, I think I feel like that's maybe why he was so uh, attached to getting a musician because he grew up with Uta, who was a musician uh, for the red-haired, or red-haired pirates and, and Shanks' crew. And so I think that had a lot to do with his sort of desire for wanting a musician. And now that he's met Brooke here, he's finally going to get his musician. But yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to really kind of touch upon. 